My job tonight is simply to introduce this guy. This guy is Chris Harvey. He is, he'll tell you more about himself. Um, all that I'll say about him is that he's our candidate for the diaconate. We the church has married men who can become permanent deacons. They go through a five-year training, weekend warrior kind of training. And um, you're three years into it? Yeah, exactly 24 months to go. So, God willing, Bishop willing, he might even be assigned here. Of course, he might send him to a different parish. Well, that, that's the hope. <laughs> but for the Becoming Catholic sessions every other week, he will usually be the one presenting. I am like Janetti will fill in some of the time. Okay. Thank you, Father. And everybody keep track when he rolls his eyes, because then I'll know I said something that's not quite 100% accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to make this work tonight, and I'm not sure how well it'll work. I realize coming out of COVID, I no longer have a working clicker. It doesn't arrive until tomorrow, so this may or may not do it, or I may just go with it. Um, we will start and end each one of these sessions with a, a prayer. And the prayer will actually mean something to what we're talking about tonight. I'd like to do this collectively. So can everybody see that okay? Yeah. Okay, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He is conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to death. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to start out tonight by telling you my story, because I think I have kind of a unique story. With the exception right here of the Holy Catholic Church, my guess is any of you that were Protestant have seen that prayer just a little bit differently. And what I want to make sure I do here is, is not attack people that are thinking about leaving one church and coming here, but more selling the Catholic Church for the beauty that it is, the truth that it is. And I think I'm in a unique perspective to do that because 30 years ago, I was sitting in those chairs. And when I came into the church, I had a chip on my shoulder. I should probably switch the slide. Going back to the 1970s, I had a grandmother that was a church secretary. I had a grandpa that was a session member, so at the top tier of the Presbyterian church. An uncle that sat there, and a father that was a deacon. I spent all my free time at the Presbyterian Church. As I grew up, I went to Sunday school, I went to youth group. By the time I got to high school, I have a tendency to look left, I apologize, it's not anything over here. By the time I got to high school, I was singing in the chancel choir. I was the youngest deacon in the Presbyterian Church at that time in the nation. Little different. You just get asked to be a deacon in the Presbyterian Church. It's not five years of book work. But I was set up to become a Presbyterian minister. That's the direction I was going to go. Anybody want to take a guess what happened? What usually happens to young men when they start making decisions? Yes? You met your wife. I did. <laughs> God works in interesting ways. I got to college and I ended up with three girlfriends in a row, all psych majors, all Catholic. God was pulling me in that direction. And I met a young lady whose father had gone to Bernadale which was the precious blood over in Akron for four years and was that close to becoming a priest. And my mother-in-law got involved. That's another story. Oh, boy. My wife jokingly says I need to be a deacon to set things right in their family because they took a priest out of, out of the vocation <laughs> and my father-in-law. But they're a very Catholic family and it was very obvious that I was not going to be a Presbyterian minister if I was going to be in that family. It was never said, but you just kind of knew. 
So I go to Immaculate Conception in Salina with a huge chip on my shoulder, sitting where you guys are sitting. And I was looking for reasons to shoot down the Catholic Church because it wasn't the church that I loved that I grew up in. I wasn't passive aggressive about it. I just left every RCI class that I went to unhappy and Nancy knew I was unhappy. And after about, I don't remember, three or four sessions, I just stopped going. And as you know, God works in interesting ways, about a year passed, and a friend, well, a friend of my brother-in-law's, his college roommate, who's also from Mercer County. Those of you that don't know Mercer County, that's Vatican 2.0. <laughs> yeah, it's just like Putnam County. And he asked me to go out and visit the old seminary of the Precious Blood. I don't know if you've ever toured it. It's beautiful just south of Grand Lake St. Mary's. At the time, it was a retirement community for priests. Now it's, it's, uh, it's like retirement living. They turned it into condoms for Catholic families. And I believe there's still a few priests out there, if I'm not mistaken. And he had me meet Brother Theophane. And Brother Theophane, I didn't know it at the time, had taught RCIA in cold water for years. He cut hair. He played the organ. He did a little bit of everything. And he asked me if I would just want to meet with him one night a week. And it started out that first night, we met for two hours, and for the first time I felt comfortable. Because he didn't attack what I was doing, or where I'd been, he just wanted to talk truth. And I was a history major, I'm all about truth. One of my pet peeves, I see on social media, all of this information that's out there, people cite their opinion as fact, it's not fact. I like truth, because you can't go wrong with truth. Truth is right, it's just the bottom line, you can't dispute truth. And he went at it from a perspective of truth. And I met with him three to four hours, one night a week for a year. That was my RCIA. It was unreal. I mean, it really was unreal. I mean, I've got a brother and I've got an entire bill. Sorry. I'm glad I don't have who uh, let the dogs out anymore. <laughs> You know, all joking aside, on a side note, I used to have Hang On Slippy on there, and I went to a big community meeting in Toledo. I work with the hospitals, and there were like 50 people in the room, and I went to the bathroom, and I'm standing at the urinal, and I can hear on, just louder than loud in this room where my phone is, Hang On Sloopy, and then everybody's laughing. So I try to pick something that's a little bit more uplifting, so if it goes off in the community like this, it's not anything questionable. And I'm sure Father will appreciate that when I'm up in front of church. We'll have to teach you how to silence. <laughs> yes. I, I'm not real good with that. I, I'm the king of butt dialing and everything else. That thing I still struggle with. Mike can attest to that. Yeah, where was I? I completely lost my train of thought. RCIA one year. Oh, going out there with, with the priest. I mean, it was really nice to be in that environment because, you know, the old saying, baptism by fire, I'm in a building with people that felt like they were just like me. And I realized that our faiths weren't that different. And I joined the church, and I went to the church, and I still struggled. And that's one of the reasons I'm glad I do this, this program, because I'm going to share with you a lot of my struggles, things that I struggled with, like the Virgin Mary, let's say, because that wasn't something we talked about in the Protestant church. And maybe if I can share with you some of the struggles I had, it'll help you guys get through some of the struggles that you're having. And maybe I'll teach you some things you didn't know. One of the blessings of being in the uh, diaconate and doing this, I'm learning a lot of information that I never knew before. So hopefully, uh, if you've got a pretty good foundation in the Catholic Church, you might pick up a thing or two that's, that's of value. And I mean, who would have thought, uh, you know, a young kid that's going to become a Presbyterian minister is now in the diaconate program, with the Catholic Church. But you know, the reality is, is that there's a lot of similarities. You just have to kind of get through that. I mean, there are some key things we're gonna talk about, and we're gonna start talking about that tonight, that there are differences between the faiths, but we have a lot more in common than we have differences. So with that being said, whoops, left and right, left and right. I'm gonna stand over here for a second because I don't think I can read that. What are the differences between the Protestant Church and the Roman Catholic Church? And I think we may even touch a little bit on agnostic in general, people that don't have the belief, because I have to assume there may be people that come to these groups that don't really have that deep foundation. 
I, I thought it was interesting. I read a statistic, and I don't remember the number. How few people ever actually read the Bible cover to cover? It, it, it's a small percentage. And I would love to see the statistic how many people even read just the four books of the gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I, I bet we would be disappointed in how many people have read that. The beautiful thing about the Catholic Church is, Father on a three-year cycle gets through the majority of the Bible, the, the big stories. We get that on a three-year cycle, and not many faiths do that. But we, as, as Christians, we worship God. But the principles of faith are different. And it makes sense they're different. Because the Protestant church, when Christ was around 2,000 years ago, didn't write anything down about the Protestant church. It didn't exist for 1,500 years. So there's going to be differences. We're going to talk about those differences. Protestants and Catholics agree on Jesus. We also believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And for those of you that are coming from a Protestant church, I'm guessing you've got a pretty good foundation on Father and Son. But I know the Holy Spirit can be a little bit more uh, confusing. I don't remember growing up in the Protestant church ever talking about the Holy Spirit. I remember having the Holy Spirit in prayers, but if you were to ask me to define what that meant, I, I, I would have struggled. And there's going to be other words that we'll talk about, like grace, that I think probably there may be some struggles, because those are also, that's another word that we didn't use a lot in the Protestant church. So not all Protestant churches have the same doctrine. I was shocked, and I didn't know this until the Diakon program, 35,000 different Protestant denominations. And they can be very, very different. Think about that for a second. 500 years ago, the Protestant church started primarily in Germany and, and England. And today, 35,000 denominations. How many denominations, I'm going to use the word denominations, how many different churches do we have within the Catholic church? We have one. Father talked about that last week. But for all practical purposes, we're following the magisterium. We're following the Pope. There's not, it, it, I had a hard time putting this together because I don't even know necessarily how to even define the word Protestant except for the word protest, as Mike and I talked about earlier. Because it all started out of protest, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too. But there's a lot of different churches. So saying someone's Protestant, can really be quite confusing. A Baptist, a Methodist, I feel like I'm starting a joke. You know, a Baptist, a Methodist, a Catholic, <laughs> and a choir. But I'm not, I'm not going to go there. But the reality is, is that they're very, very different. It's important to know that. So I'm going to use this term as a blanket term for all Protestants as we move forward. But just know they're not all the same. Protestants and Catholics have a very different view of the nature of church. Did anybody know that Catholic means all-embracing? One universal church, all-embracing. And it sees itself as the only true church worldwide under the leadership of the Pope. I mean no disrespect to a Protestant that hears that, but we do believe that there's one universal church, and that's this church right here. Can anybody tell me where that red came from? You guys recognize that from Mass every Sunday? And we're going to break that down. We're going to break that down and we're going to talk about each line over the next couple of months, what that really means. Because there's words in that that are a little bit difficult to understand. And we're going to break it down to make sure that we all have a grasp on you know, that belief, that we believe what's written, what we're saying. And it's really easy to say things for year after year after year and not necessarily understand what we're saying. And we really do need to understand our faith. The Protestant churches emerged from the Reformation approximately 500 years ago. The Catholic Church did some things at that time that were not loved by all people. And the Protestant Church came out of that. And we'll talk about that too, the term indulgences and some other things. But please understand when this all happened, and it's kind of interesting how it played out. There were really two key players. Everybody heard of Martin Luther? Martin Luther was a priest in Germany. He was one of the catalysts behind the start of the Protestant Reformation. Anybody remember from your history classes Henry VIII? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Henry VIII liked the ladies. Henry VIII was friends with the Pope. 
the Pope wasn't just going to issue annulments whenever Henry VIII decided that he wanted a new wife. So when you're the king of England, what do you do? You start your own church. And you can have as many annulments as you want because you're the head of your church. Here's a little known fact, and I hope Father doesn't roll his eyes on this. I'm hoping that this information is accurate. I read an article a couple of years ago that Martin Luther wanted to remove one-third of the books of the Bible. How many books of the Bible were removed when the Protestant church started? Seven. Why did he not remove a third of the Bible? People probably would have taken off and headed for the hills. I mean, that's a lot of the Bible to just delete. And it's always made me wonder, and I can't prove this, but it's always made me wonder where the number of the books of the Bible were removed somewhat arbitrary. I know I grew up believing that Catholics added books to the Bible. I don't know why I thought that. And I was a Catholic for a couple of years before I realized it was the other way around. Who wrote the Bible? Anybody want to take a stab at that? The Holy Spirit and who was holding the pen? Yep, man. And if you if you do your history on that, you'll see Moses was involved, and you'll see that there were the followers of the apostles that were involved, and it was written in the hundreds, several of the books, the Gospels were written in the hundreds of years after the death of Christ. But you've got a relationship. You've got the Holy Spirit and man writing the Bible, right? Who revised the Bible when the Protestant church started? I want to say King James. King James was involved, Elizabeth I. Yeah. Don't um, forget Martin Luther. Yeah, no, nobody's telling me the Holy Spirit was involved. So we've got a book that we followed for 2,000 years that was written jointly between man and God, that was revised without God. I'm not going to uh, stand up here and, uh, and get into this in great detail, but I would encourage you to actually think about that. That's kind of dangerous to revise the Word of God. So with that being said, the Protestant churches have emerged from the Reformation and refer to themselves as evangelical, which means according to the gospel. They do not make up one united church. Like we said, there's lots of them and a lot of denominations that are out there. If you look off to the right there, that's what a Protestant church looks like. That's the church that many of you and myself may have grown up in. We have God. We have Jesus. We have the apostles. And we have the Bible. That's what we have. As you can see here, the Bible is here with the Catholic Church, but tradition and the church itself are the other two legs of the stool. When I say the tradition, and this gets a little bit confusing and complicated, I don't want to get into it too deeply. So much of the Bible was written from tradition, oral tradition in the Old Testament. It's not like somebody was walking around behind Moses taking notes. A lot of what we do comes from tradition. If you were to read a book of the Bible, and you'd be like, there's stuff in this story like the birth of Christ. There's stuff in this story that I remember more to it than that. There was a lot that was said that was never put into writing, and we incorporate that into our teaching. So much of what happened back then was oral tradition. And it's interesting with the Old Testament being written from oral tradition, how can the Protestant church not also say that they believe in tradition? Because it factors in whether they like it or not. And I struggled with that myself. Because I think about the church I grew up in. And, okay, everything comes from the Bible, and tradition doesn't factor into anything. Then why are there three steps? leading up to the altar? And why were there three steps leading up to the lectern? Because we all knew that was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Why is there a cross in the front with a crown of thorns on top of it? If we're going strictly from the book, why are we decorating the church in a similar fashion to the Catholic Church and the tradition that we had here? Keep in mind, 500 years ago, 
The Protestants wanted to differentiate themselves from the Catholic Church. And so tradition got kind of put on the back burner. They wanted to look different. So they really put all their cards in one hat, and that was scripture itself. The magisterium is the church. I probably should have put that word there. Does anybody know what magisterium means? It's a big word, and it's pretty simple. Who lives in Rome? The Pope. The Pope, the Cardinals. All of the people that lead the churches make up the magisterium. Rome is what, ought, what, what, ought, what comes to mind typically. The people, and I mean, think about it from a government perspective. We've got Congress that leads the country. We have the magisterium that leads our church. And they're also the entity that, that makes the decisions, that interprets our faith. And we, we view that very heavily. I mean, you really need that structure in place. And Father, this will be another time you may roll your eyes, I'm not sure. I think a big part of the reason why we've been so lucky to maintain the church as one entity is because we have that leadership piece. When you lack leadership, what happens? Don't things, yeah, things go muck, they go all over the place. And we talked about 35,000 Protestant denominations. We really need that. I mean, for something to maintain itself, I mean, obviously you've got the grace of God keeping the church going, but you also have the magisterium kind of following that line and making sure that things are going <coughs> the right way for the right reason and interpreting the scripture itself. So that's a big difference. And you, will, you won't hear the Protestant church viewing um, <coughs> their leadership structure quite the same way. And I was looking at this, and I almost wish I would put a line across this way. Because when you think about our church, the Catholic Church, you've got the magisterium at the top and it's hierarchical coming down. Most Protestant, Protestant churches are aligned this way. It's kind of a church full of lay people. And a minister is more of a lay person that kind of leads the congregation. But it's different than what our priests are like. It's, it's a different type of situation. And even trying to define what a minister is in a Protestant church can be tough because some have doctorates, some have masters, some have bachelor's <coughs> degrees, and some have a certificate from an online course. So they're not all the same. It's different. And as we talk a little bit more about that, forgiveness of sins and things like that factor into it. Now, you're, you're not going to like what I have to say about that possibly because it's not going to be consistent with um, the, what the Protestant church does. is not consistent with the Bible. But we're here to learn what the truth is, not what Chris's opinions are. I never saw this stool until I started doing RCI. I can't believe it. I went 50 some years without seeing this stool. But the stool really does lay out what I just talked about. The Protestant church bases everything off of a one-legged stool. And when you put all your eggs in one basket like that, how many people have ever tried to sit on a one-legged stool and not get bloody knees or fall flat on their back? If we take one of those legs away from the Catholic church, the magisterium, scripture, and what's the third one? What happens if we take one leg away? We fall. So I threw a couple words in there that you're going to hear, and I think it's important that we know. When you look at Luther, who was you know, the more vocal, probably, of the Protestant ministers, they talked about sola, fide, I think it's pronounced, faith alone, which just means the Bible only. Or is that sola scriptura? Mike, help me out if you're better at this. No. Scripture no. alone, sola scriptura, and sola fide is faith alone. I interchange those sometimes. I'm not a Protestant anymore. I haven't been one for 30 years. So once again, like you can see, 30,000 denominations, yeah, 30, that says 33, it's been updated, 35,000 denominations. A little bit more about tradition and scripture. scripture. You'll hear the term sola scriptura. And Mike actually caught me stumbling on my words a little bit ago. We're in the Bible. Does it talk about that, Mike? Mike, sola. 
scripture alone? Oh, you're not there. <laughs> he was there earlier, right? Yes, he was. Where in the Bible does it talk about scripture alone? Nowhere. Why not? Holy Spirit didn't write about it, did he? There was no Protestant church. The Catholic Church states, I, I wish I would have put more of that in there because it would have flowed better, does not de derive for a certainty about the re revealed truth from the Holy Scripture alone. We take our beliefs from tradition and we also take them. <clears throat> or we accept and honor with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. I don't got my glasses on, I'm sorry. I cannot wait to have that clicker. <laughs> We talked a little bit about the Bible itself, and here's something that I found very interesting, and I'm gonna I'm gonna let you guys in you know uh, on a little secret, a little bit of my orneriness. One of the previous RCIA classes that I did, I had someone in that class that wanted to compare and contrast what it says in the Catholic Bible and the Protestant Bible. So. I went home that night and we talked about some things related to the Bible, some of the things we talked about in RCIA, and I wrote down on a piece of paper all of these different Bible verses. And I came back the next Sunday and we took this topic up again, and I started citing these Bible verses, and uh, this person was quick to say, well, this is why I don't believe in this. This is why I don't believe in this. And we kind of went back and forth for about a half an hour and I started to laugh. And this particular person said, Chris, uh, what's so funny? I said, everything you don't believe in are the Bible verses that I took out of the Protestant Bible. And I challenged that person to not be as defensive as I was because I was funny because I was that defensive person. If you look at the New Testament, you're going to find a lot of stuff that's the same. You're not going to, or you're going to find that too in the Old Testament, but I, I know a lot of folks are more familiar with the New Testament than the Old Testament because the Gospels are in there. The beliefs that we're going to talk about over the next six months are very similar except for some key issues. And those key issues are big, don't get me wrong. But you're going to see a lot of similarities. And I really, if you're feeling the need to defend the Protestant Bible, come talk to me. Come talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. I've been there. I wanted the Catholic Bible to be wrong. But the truth is in there. And it's the truth that was written 2,000 years ago prior to revision. And that really, that really was an eye-opener for me. Father said something to me, and this is the first priest that ever said it. If you're somebody that goes seeking the truth, and you're somebody that just goes and looks for what's out there based off of the belief system of the Christian faith, you're going to find the truth. And the truth is going to lead you to the Catholic Church. And it does. When you look at a history book, the facts are the facts. When you look at the traditions, the facts are the facts. I, uh, I challenged myself to do this in my first year of the diaconate program. There were so many things that have been written over the years that um, make the Catholic Church look negative. And we've assumed that it's true forever. Not forever, but for our lifetimes. And this book was written, it talked about 10 different things that we believe from our history. And it was a book written by Protestants, and these were all things that made the Catholic Church look bad, that were never true in the first place. How many people remember Christopher Columbus? How many people remember sitting in history class? And in history class, they talked about Christopher Columbus was not supposed to cross the ocean because the world was flat. And uh, the Protestants had a lot of fun in the 1800s talking about how silly we were for believing that. We knew Isabella, Christopher Columbus, who's going to fall off the face of the earth. If we could bring Christopher Columbus and Queen Isabella back right now, what do you think they have to say about all of that? Any idea? They wouldn't have, they wouldn't have any idea what that even meant. Because that belief wasn't written. It never even surfaced until the 1800s. Remember the story of Sleepy Hollow? Washington Irving, if I remember correctly? He wrote that at a time in our history that people were writing things about the Catholic Church to make the Catholic Church look bad. A lot of what we hear out there isn't true. 
somebody very close to me in my life had shared with me that they thought that the Catholic Church sold, sold indulgences. Something that the priest could get a little bit of pocket money and could say some special prayers and get you a little bit closer to heaven. You know how long it's been since that was done? About the time of Luther. About the time of Luther. 1500s. It's actually a heresy now. A priest can be excommunicated for doing that. I haven't heard of that happening with any in quite a while. But it's not true. It's a heresy. So we've got our Bible. We've got our seven extra books. You're not going to find a lot. You, I would not suggest that people try to look for the differences between the two because we're going to cover the differences between the two. And I think you're going to, you're going to come to the conclusion that, huh, we're a lot more alike than we are different. Salvation and grace. If I were to ask you guys to write down your definition of grace, I have a funny feeling everybody in this room would write down a very different definition. And if you were to ask me as a Protestant to write down my definition of grace, I would have just sat there drooling on myself. I would have been looking at my feet. I would have had no idea. That was not a word that I ever heard in the Presbyterian Church. It was not something that stressed, but I, I couldn't even begin to guess how many times Father has used that word when he's in church or outside of church. And it's so hard to try to define until we start to think about it. it. When you were a kid and you wanted to be in your mother's good grace, what did that mean? You didn't want her man Right. You wanted to be in her favor. We want to be in God's favor. And that's very important because God's all about love. Are we deserving of God's help? Depends who you ask, if you ask yourself or if you ask God. So I'm just going to read that because I found that online. I absolutely love that definition. I think it puts it better than anything I could say. Grace is favor, the free and undeserving help that God gives us to respond to his call to become children of God. Adoptive sons partakers of the divine nature of eternal life. Make it a whole lot simpler. God wants us to love him as much as uh, he wants us to love him as much as he loves us. He wants to draw us closer and he wants us to be in his favor. Protestants often express the idea of salvation by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, being spiritual but not necessarily religious. I have said that in my life when I was younger. I think I'm a spiritual person. I've heard people say, I'm spiritual, I don't need to go to church. There's a difference between being spiritual and being religious. We're called to be a part of the church body. We're, a, we're called to be a part of the religion. We're called to do good works. I remember growing up believing that uh, good works was something that I was commanded to do in the Protestant church. I don't know where that came from because that's not a Protestant belief. Good works is something that we believe as Catholics. I think a lot of Protestants would be surprised to hear that. I was surprised to hear that. But that's a Catholic belief. It's all about believing in Jesus, believing in the Bible as a Protestant, and that's your ticket to heaven. Wow. I'm not exactly sure where you're going to go to get those sins forgiven in that model. We'll talk about that a little bit more, too. The Roman Catholic Church is dependent on the grace you receive by participating in the church, which is seen as a repository for saving grace. Grace is treated almost as if it's a substance, something that can be dispensed through various avenues of change and means. You're saved by grace. But how you receive that grace and what that grace does, is whether it's a one-time entrance into Christian life or if it's a constant movement towards salvation, that's really the biggest difference. <coughs> and that's something I think back, and I see the flaw in it now that I'm Catholic, but as a Protestant, I never saw that. I grew up believing. I believe in Jesus. I can say my prayers at night, ask for forgiveness, and that's all I have to do. And it's, I, I notice that it's really easy to become a lazy Christian when that's the model that we live by. Because there's no accountability. There's no fellowship. 
you're not sharing your belief with other people, there's no even evangelization, you're just basically going through the motions. When I had that epiphany moment there, I realized that it was almost like I was practicing my religion as 1.0, like a college freshman. And then I come over to the Catholic Church and I start getting more involved and say, no, no, I'm like a graduate student. I took my faith to a whole other level, it meant more. It was of value. I look forward to coming to church rather than just showing up for an hour once a week. It's really a different mindset. Grace is really important. If we're striving for that grace of God, our life is going to be better. We're going to be happier. We're going to be more engaged in positive activities. I can make a pretty good case that if everybody on this planet was focused on God's grace, all of this ridiculous stuff we see on social media would come away because our hearts would be in the right place. Just a little bit of a political dig there. The Eucharist. My biggest struggle when I joined the church. The Eucharist. And I continue to develop an understanding of this as every year goes on and more of an appreciation. And I'll explain that to you. When I grew up, and I, I mean no disrespect by saying this, this is the honest truth. The church I grew up in, in the kitchen, there were jars of great high seed, and there were bags of croutons, seasoned croutons. I don't know why Father doesn't let us have seasoned hosts. I mean, the Protestant churches do it. But it was seasoned croutons. It was the same grape juice we drank in Sunday school. Same cans. The croutons, whenever we had our quarterly communion services, we would have a potluck downstairs. Guess where the leftover croutons went? Yep, right on top of the salad. They didn't mean a lot. The service itself meant something. We felt closer to God. But when a Protestant says that they're going to church, and we'll, we'll really hammer down on this later, when a Protestant goes to church, they're just honoring God. They're honoring his death. It's different for a Catholic. This isn't something that a Protestant can do. Anybody in here know what apostolic succession is? Is that word? Go ahead. It's like succession. Exactly true. There's actually a website out there, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's almost like a family tree. Bishop Thomas can actually trace himself back, and I'm, I don't remember how far. Do you remember, Father, how's that work? Is it beyond the Council of Trent? It's about the Council of Trent, 1500s. But there has been a succession <coughs> of bishops have appointed every bishop for 2,000 years. Who were the first bishops? What? The apostles. Who was the first pope? Peter. Peter. I've seen the t-shirt, and I keep swearing I'm going to get the t-shirt. I love the t-shirt. <laughs> who started the Protestant church? I mean, who started the Presbyterian church? Actually, most Presbyterians would know that I didn't. No. I looked up. I'd never heard of John Knox. Who started the Lutheran church? Who started the Methodist Church? No, no, that was Thomas. Yep, that, that was going to be the next one. Who started the Methodist Church? Wesley. Yep, Wesley. Who started our church? Yep. You don't hear that in, in the Protestant churches. It kind of takes something away from the Protestant churches. Because the very person that they, you know, that they're worshiping started our church. It's, it's, a, it, it's a different way of looking at it. And when we come to the Eucharist, it's different too. Because you can't have a Protestant pastor turn the wine and the juice into the body and blood of Christ. They don't have that capacity. They can't do it. You need him. You need that apostolic succession. In the Bible, Jesus gave the apostles the ability to do that. And that's continued for 2,000 years. And it's not us honoring Christ. Well, it is us honoring Christ, but it goes beyond that. That word right there. 
body and blood. You'll hear Protestants say, well, you're a bunch of cannibals. It's not like that. It's not like we're, we're killing people and we're consuming people. But Christ in the Protestant Bible says to consume my body and blood. That's not just the Catholic Bible. That's the Protestant Bible also. And that's what transubstantiation means. And it, it's a lot different than just um, getting out the croutons and getting out the high sea. If you listen to Father's words, the Holy Spirit's coming down. And he's actually, Christ is present. And the saints are present. You'll hear people say, maybe you haven't heard people say that God's outside of time and space. God's everywhere, past, present, and future. When we're doing this, how do I want to say this? We're in the Last Supper. That's not what it's like in the Protestant church. We're in the Last Supper. And we're experiencing Christ just like the apostles did. And it's, it's a different feeling. It's, it's a very different feeling. It's not like getting the croutons in the high sea. It's a very different feeling. You feel the presence of God. And if you really want to take it to the next level, start becoming a Eucharistic minister. Because when you're giving it to someone else, it really increases for me that feeling of Christ's presence. I never experienced that in the Protestant church. I felt good getting communion, but I never felt that presence of Christ. And that is a huge difference between the two churches. And it's backed up in the Bible. And I'll share that Bible verse with you later. I don't have it memorized. But we're commanded to do that. Christ has told us to do that. And, that, and this is just an overview right now. I did this two months ago. I'm going to have to read number six because I don't remember what I put on. Justification. That's number six on my list. Gracious and judicial act of God whereby a soul is granted complete absolution from all guilt and full release from plenary of sin. As previously discussed, Protestants view justification as a woman of God declares the guilty person is righteous because of what Christ has done. Sanctification then is the process of being made more righteous throughout your life. Catholics view justification as both a point of process. What the Roman Catholic rejects is that there is an imputed righteousness in Christ to us at the moment of salvation and we are counted as fully righteous in the sight of God. I'm going to skip that one for now because that's going to turn into a half an hour discussion. I know I talked about it later. Um, but what I do want to talk about right there, and I don't remember if I put that in there or not. Let me go. I don't think I talked about um, reconciliation, forgiveness of sins. And that's actually what I meant to put there, and I cut and paste the wrong thing in that spot. Um, how does a Protestant get forgiveness of sins? Anybody know? Pretty easy. Mm -hmm. My, my first fiance, his, his big thing was, all I have to do is say I'm sorry. Did anybody tell me? Go ahead. Direct, maybe direct straight to Jesus himself. So they Can anybody tell me where it says that in the Bible? Nowhere. Well, I always thought they, they repent, put their trust in Christ, and they are baptized, and that's how they become a Christian. The sins are forgiven of baptism, but you're not going to find anything in the Bible that reinforces that. Actually, if you look in the Bible, it talks about God sending the apostles out, and the apostles were then going to forgive sins. I think Father talked about this a month or two ago, and the apostles are going to forgive sins, and if the apostles don't forgive the sins, then the sins aren't forgiven. And the successors continued that practice, and Father in the confessional is a part of that process. But there's a big question mark about taking sins directly to God. I'm not telling anybody here that you can't take your sins directly to God. I'm not telling you you can't. Because that book that we've been talking about, the Bible, 
does Negressa. It's a practice that started 500 years ago. And it's a practice that the Protestant churches would have to use if they wouldn't have forgiveness of sins because they don't have apostolic succession. They don't have the priest to forgive the sins. But we just don't know. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that you're not. And I ask Father this question. I've asked more than one priest this question. Does that mean my Protestant parents aren't going to go to heaven since they're not Catholic? And the simple answer that I've gotten any time I've asked that question is quite simply, we don't know. It's not in the Bible. A Protestant pastor would probably turn beet red. I've actually gone on that mission trying to find it. Now, I'm not going to tell you you can't get to heaven either. That's actually one of the heresies out there. Priests have been excommunicated. Actually, a priest that I, I read a story about was excommunication, excommunicated for telling people that you're going to go to hell if you're not a Catholic. But the reality is we don't know. I'm a, a, a common sense kind of guy. I'm kind of simple. I like the way we do it because it makes it a whole lot clearer. Christ sent the apostles out to forgive sins. Or not forgive sins. Father, in the confessional, takes care of that part of our faith for us, doesn't it? With the help of the Holy Spirit, with the help of God. I know that people struggle with that. People are afraid of confession. It's nerve-wracking and what have you. I don't... Well, for Father, he knows me. I have for years gone to other churches. And now that I'm in the diaconate program, I keep going in confessionals and running into people that I know. <laughs> so I just have to swallow my pride and assume that I'm not going to tell Father anything that's going to shock him. Father, how often do you get shocked in confession? There hasn't been an original sin since Adam and Eve. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I do want to tell you, honestly, the more you do it, the easier it gets. And you, after you get over that initial fear, it's actually something you look forward to. So Father wants all of you to go to confession every day for a year. Right, Father? <laughs> you change your every day. What? How often should you go? Just real quick. That's We're going to three months. I know. How often should you go? How many times do you have to go? Once a year. Once a year. I shoot myself to go once a month. I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, Pope Benedict that said he went every two weeks. I could be wrong there. I heard that somewhere. If you do something major, probably better to go sooner rather than later. I mean, you know, if I... Uh, if I do some big mortal sin, I'm going to hop on an airplane. I'm probably going to go to confession before I fly. I have a tendency to go to confession before I fly anyhow because I'm afraid to fly. But we'll talk a little bit more about that and how to go through that process. And there's different ways to do confession. And uh, it's not as bad as it sounds. People don't have to run for the door. It's not horrible. It's actually quite nice when you get used to it. But I've been a Catholic for 30 years, and I'm still struggling to go to the priest in the church that I go to. And that's not that uncommon of a fear. And that's actually on my list of fears to get over. Because the reality is, is it's not about me. It really isn't. It's just about the forgiveness of sin and getting closer to God. Priesthood of all believers. I don't remember putting a slide in. I can't even see the bottom of it. Oh, we did talk about that. That's apostolic succession. I'm notorious for doing that. I overplan and I do it months in advance. And then I forget what I put in there. Veneration of saints and the Virgin Mary. The second biggest struggle that I had in the Catholic Church. I remember being a sophomore in high school. And you guys remember Zeus and Dionysus and Hera and Apollo and all those Roman gods. And it was a bit of a struggle because initially, that's kind of how I looked at the idea of uh, the saints and the Virgin Mary. Because other than Christmas, we didn't really talk about the Virgin Mary in church. The Virgin Mary was kind of like Noah. 
and Moses or any of the other you know, high profile names that we would talk about in Sunday school. I actually did a little bit of research on this and I thought it was interesting. I told Mike this earlier and we had a little bit of a conversation about this. And uh, my research found that, do you know why the Protestant church doesn't venerate or worship whatever word you want, the saints or the Virgin Mary? Like the Jehovah's Witnesses didn't want to see a crown on Our Lady because they, they couldn't lose the Mother of God. So it'd be like idolatry. Yep. Yeah. Idolatry is a word we frequently hear. What, anybody else? That, that's by far the most common. Yeah. As I was digging and digging and digging, what I found was the number one reason 500 years ago that they did not want to do that was they wanted to stand away from the Catholic Church and be different. And it wasn't as much about Mary or the saints, but it was just wanting to be unique. They wanted to define their church. Did, did you roll his eyes? I didn't look. Oh. <laughs> you gave me the look. I, you're, you're my barometer for the look, I think. But the reality was, and the very first time I did this class, I'm not going to mention who I was doing this with, we actually went head to head on how we were going to word this so we didn't scare people because this is not a scary situation at all. I put the definition up there what veneration means in our faith. Honor distinct from true worship, which is due to God alone. We're not worshiping the Virgin Mary. We're worshiping God. This is not mythology. This isn't Greece. This isn't Rome thousands of years ago. Not as praying to the saints and the Virgin Mary, but praying through them. I really like that word, through. You want to say what you said to me, and I really liked what you said. Ed's old young lady were both. Hmm? I've told you two stories. One is that my husband has always pointed out the relationship with Mary is that you know, growing up, sometimes we kind of go to mom to get to dad, and so that that invitation is open in this situation of, you know, going to the Blessed Virgin Mary kind of can help us to, to get closer to the Father and actually the Trinity in whole. And then the other thing that occurred to me, being with military background, a lot of people had different views of the Catholic Church, and so one young lady that I knew in particular was very upset about this whole worshiping Mary thing, and and I asked her, I said, do you have a close relationship with your mother? And she said, no, we were actually don't get along at all. And I said, I'm sorry to hear that, but how wonderful that God gives us a mother to turn to in that challenge. And so the way that I've always kind of understood it is we get sort of the best of both worlds. Either we have a good relationship with our mother and it allows us to have that relationship with the Blessed Mother, or if we're either missing it because of um, a negative situation, or in my case, my mom passed away two years ago, it gives me that link to my own mother through Jesus' as mother. So we kind of, God's got us covered, I guess, is my point. No, I, I like that very much. Uh, this, this has been an area in my uh, diaconate program that I've talked to uh, Father Jeff, who's my spiritual director, because I'm trying to improve my relationship with Mary also. Because that's something that for the last 30 years I've struggled a little bit just because I grew up like a lot of you did where all of your energy is geared towards God. And I, I noticed that the more I develop an understanding of, of not just Mary but the saints also, I develop a closer relationship to the church and the history of the church and all of the great things that were done. I mean, just sit down and Google Mother Teresa. It's inspiring. Or... I think it's next Thursday at the theater is when there's going to be a movie about her just for one night. And you can do that with a lot of saints. You're going to notice that there's some saints that you feel closer to than others. Maybe St. Michael, Mother Teresa is a good one. And you guys will all be assigned or you'll pick a saint that you feel some closeness to. Um, anybody recognize any of the saints up there? St. Aloysius. What? St. Aloysius. Yep, he's down in the corner. Holy Family, Our Lady of Guadalupe. I had them all looked up two months ago and I can't remember all of them, so I was hoping you guys would bail me out. 
Is that the same thing? Who? Is that the same thing? And I will be honest with you, I don't always necessarily want to have all the answers because this isn't my journey. This is your journey. You've got to want to be Catholic for you, not for me. And it, it's something that you're going to grow and you're going to learn all your lives if you if you put the effort into it. I don't think I have a ton more. I'm going to hold off on um, oh, I do want to read that, though, because I thought it was beautiful. The Virgin Mary is seen as the mother of our Lord, and therefore she is the mother of his body, and his body is the church, so she's the mother of the church. He is the creator of all things, so she's the mother of angels. She's the mother of humanity, as it is sometimes said, she is viewed as the queen of heaven. That's impressive beyond belief. How much time do we have? Two minutes. How many? <laughs> Two. Father talked about this last time. Um, I'm going to skip that for now. The last thing that I'll talk about is this slide is purgatory. And we will talk about this. This is just a brief overview a little bit more. But purgatory is something hard to wrap our mind around. And I'm a visual person, so I put that little up. There, you want to call it that little graph there. Purgatory is the condition, process, or place of purification for temporal punishment in which, according to medieval Christians and the Roman Catholic belief, souls who die are in a state, that are not in a state of grace are made ready for heaven. And uh, I always get this question, so I put a Bible verse on there. This is actually biblical, but those of you that think back a couple of slides, how many of you saw Maccabees as one of the books that the Protestant Church does not have? I actually had to look this up years ago when I was having this debate with my mom because she's like, where does the Bible say that? Well, it didn't say it in her Bible. But thus he made atonement for the dead and they be, 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 that they might be freed from sin. So uh, as we look at that, it, it's, it's a pretty simple model here. This is us on earth. Souls are purified before they go to heaven. Souls that need pur purification go to purgatory. And if you're in mortal sin, you'll go to hell. And uh, I'm not going to go into that right now because purgatory is a fairly long discussion. And I know the question is going to come up if I, if I continue right now. Well, if I'm only going at Easter time to, uh, to confession, well, then probably about a week after I went to confession for the next 52 weeks, I'm going to be in a state of mortal sin and I'm going to go to hell except for that one week a year. And it's not that black and white. And we're going to talk about what that looks like a little bit more. I jokingly tell the story of going up to Perrysburg to church. And I'm driving away. And I saw a woman sitting on a uh, riding lawnmower in a bikini. And uh, she was mowing. And she was very pretty. And I laughed to myself and said, God, do I need to turn around? <laughs> So we're going to talk about all that a little bit later, but that's a much deeper conversation because purgatory is something that's tough for us to wrap our minds around. So I'm going to fast forward to my prayer for everybody. And I will just read this. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, oh my God, I firmly believe that you are one God and three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe that you are divine. The divine son became man and died for our sins that he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe these and all truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches because you have revealed them and you can neither deceive nor be deceived. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All this stuff we talked about tonight, this is more of an overview. And I can't wait to load my clicker so I can step back far enough that I can read. Um, we're going to talk about this in greater detail, but what I would encourage you to do is, if the things are popping up that you're struggling with, talk to me, talk to Mike, talk to Father. Maybe something that I struggle to explain, they'll have a pearl of wisdom or vice versa that will help you figure it out. But what I really, if nothing else, 
I don't want people leaving with unanswered questions and frustration and confusion. So I'll always stick around a few minutes afterwards so you can bring your questions and maybe bring them back. I'll bring them back next week to clarify something a little bit further. But with that being said, Father said I had 10 minutes and he's the boss. Does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask in the front of everybody? <laughs> I'm okay if you want to stop me. Because I will find the answer out. I don't know everything. I mean, there's just millions of pages about our faith. And they're so fascinating. Yes? How do you explain to a Protestant about purgatory if the book of Maccabees is not in the Bible? <coughs> if what? If the book of Maccabees is not in the Bible. I've actually had this conversation, and I actually started from the premise of we need to talk about the difference between our faiths. And I operate from the premise that the Bible is intact with those seven books. And you actually have to develop an understanding, and you have to go to the Bible. And you, know, you get a lot of miles of just doing a Google search if you're uncertain and say, what Bible verses have to do with this? We break down those Bible verses and we have that discussion. That's exactly what we did. And the fact that Maccabees wasn't a book in the Bible, it's interesting that there's a shift that's going on. The, there's a lot of Bible, Protestant Bible um, companies that are pr producing, they're editing, they're printing the books. That's the word that I was looking for. Are actually starting to put those seven books in their appendix. Mm -hmm. And they're starting to look at some of the writings. I, I was shocked to find that out, but there's actually books out there that are putting them in the appendix. And I mean, it makes it a little easier. You don't have as many versions of the Bible. But I, I would take a look at the Bible itself, and, and I, I, would, I would break down that book. It's not like the Protestant churches believe that there's not value in those seven books, even though they're not in their Bible. They're just not elevated to that level of the Bible itself. But purgatory is something that you're very likely not going to sell to a Protestant until they actually get into the discussions, they get into an RCI or something, and they, and they start to work through the process, because that's not an easy sell. It wasn't an easy sell for me. I mean, I, I, I want to see what it looks like. But I believe, I believe because the Bible talks about it. I mean, I, but it, it takes a while. And I also talk about the mysteries of faith. Sometimes you've got to grow your faith. Sometimes you have to continue to learn before you get to that point where you get it. I mean, I was a Catholic a lot of years before I felt like I'd arrived. I didn't feel like I arrived when I walked out of our CIA. And I will add, there is a passage in one of St. Paul's letters that could be interpreted in terms of purgatory. Um, it's from 1 Corinthians. Um, talks about the day will disclose it, it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each one's works. But if someone's work is burned up, that one will suffer loss. The person will be saved, but only as through fire. So that aspect of still being saved, but some kind of suffering, that is what the purgatory is find in uh, the letter to the Hebrews that Jesus is made perfect by what he suffered. Of course, he tells us we have to take up our crosses daily, and that is what purgatory ultimately is, this kind of suffering that leads to perfection, because it's cleansing us of our earthly attachments. And that's, that, that's a big disconnect for Protestants because they understand forgiveness, but they don't understand that cleansing piece because from their perspective, once their sins are forgiven, yeah, and that's a huge shift. But that's not biblical. That's something that they made up 500 years ago. Yes? I want to offer something that kind of ties into your talking about grace. You're also talking about reconciliation. And I feel so bad in your sharing your personal experience. And I'm sure you're going to do it more depth later. But when we talk about every time there's a reconciliation, we have to recognize the potential for that free gift of grace to be offered. And that is a super, supernatural nourishment that we need then to help be stronger against sin. So um, I, yes. there's a lot of apprehensional a lot of times with that sacrament that you can receive over and over again. But it would be forfeiting that free gift, like the, the potential that it would be that gift as well. 
Yeah, and I, I promise you we'll break that down a little bit more. I, when we get done with talking about confession or reconciliation, you won't actually open up the church program and say, I don't understand what the difference is between penance, reconciliation, and confession, because one church will have one word and one will have another word when they put it in their, in their bulletin, and you'll understand that those words... From your perspective, they have different definitions. But they, they're, they're similar, they're, there's overlap and what have you, and we'll talk about that in greater detail. And I think, I, I, hopefully I will, I will convey also when we talk about that, I know personally, I feel a higher level of closeness to God when I confess my sins. I also feel a higher level of accountability. Somebody's holding me accountable. It's way too easy to just lay in bed and say, sorry God, and then go to sleep and just do that road two sentences. I love the fact that I'm held accountable because I make better decisions in life. I know this is going to sound like, like maybe I'm being disingenuous, but I actually go into confession. I actually think about my decisions in life before I make them because I don't want to be in a state of moral sin. I like that accountability. And I think if you commit an amount of time to actually doing this regularly, a lot of you or all of you will have that same experience. And that's not love service. That's, that's true sincerity. Anything else? I'm sweating now. You might, I'm going to have to shower now, so give it to me. <laughs> if people need to, to be knowledge, certainly. I do have children, so it may be so. But if you do have questions, feel free to approach us.